Well, good morning, everyone. Have you ever had a near-death experience? A time when you thought you might not be living much longer? Uh, I've had one. Uh, one was about 30 years ago. I don't know if I shared this before. Uh, I was still in seminary at the time, and my uncle uh, from Chicago, he had a condominium in, um, in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And so he invited me to go up there uh, during my spring break to go skiing with him and his family. And so I was really, really excited because my cousin's really going to be there. And so I was living in Dallas at the time, and Dallas was about 1,000 miles from Steamboat Springs, Colorado. So I asked a friend from seminary if he'd like to go along, and he said yes. And so we were going to make the drive from Dallas to, to Steamboat Springs, because, you know, we were poor seminary students, so we couldn't afford airfare, but we, we could pay for gas because gas was cheaper back at that time. And so we drove, and... You know, we were doing fine. We left at 5 a.m. in the morning, and our hope was to arrive in Steamboat Springs at 8 p.m. that same day, okay, about 16 hours. So we're driving, and we're doing fine until we get to Denver. Uh, once we hit Denver, it starts to snow a lot. So we're driving down, uh, I think it was Interstate 70, and you can't see too well because the snow is coming down pretty badly. I'm going, wow, this is pretty bad. I mean, they haven't plowed the roads yet, and so we're driving, and you can barely see in front of you. And as I'm driving... I look to the left, and I see the guardrail, like, about an inch from my car. It's like, whoa, I'm too close. And so, you know, I'm, I, I move away from there. So anyway, we finally get off of I-70 because now we, we have to take the road to Steamboat Springs. And it's still snowing like crazy. And now we have to take these rural roads off of the main interstate to get to Steamboat Springs. And so, uh, okay, so let's, let's try this. So we're, we're going as, as carefully as we possible, as, as we could. And all of a sudden, we spun out. Like, what's going on? And all of a sudden, we're spinning around, and we kind of hit the embankment. And we're like, well, what happened? I mean, anything. I didn't hit the brakes or nothing. And all of a sudden, you know, so, okay. Uh, we started going again. I mean, what are we going to do? I don't see any hotels. Uh, it's cold outside. It's snowing. So we just got to keep going forward and see what happens. And so uh, we kept going and, 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 you know, could barely see in front of us. Uh, and then we died. No, just kidding. We didn't do that. And then, uh, then we, we kept going. And... Uh, uh, I'm thinking, man, we, we, this is it, man. We, we're either going to crash, we are going to spin out again, we're going to run out of gas, and we're going to freeze to death. I mean, I'm just, oh. So we're driving, my, my knuckles are white as I'm gripping onto the, snow, uh, the steering wheel. The, 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 the windshield's icing up because it's so cold. The windshield wipers are no good because it's ice. And I'm kind of like opening the window and looking out the side of the window to see, to make sure we're out. It was, it was just crazy. Anyway, finally, at 1 a.m., okay, five, no, six or seven hours of driving like this, barely seeing 10 feet in front of us, we finally pulled in to the lodge at Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We had made it. Five hours late, but we had made it. And there was this great sense of relief when we finally pulled into the parking spot and saw my cousins, and we just rejoiced. And then the next day, that very snow that I hated, I loved because now we were skiing. What a great feeling. I mean, everyone, you might have your share of, of harrowing experiences. You know, some are actual life and death situations like I felt when I was going driving up to Steamboat Springs. Like maybe, maybe you had an accident or maybe a, a, some of you know or you had a serious or terminal disease or, or uh, maybe you got robbed and that was a very scary situation. Um, uh, others might just feel like you're going through a very, very stressful or a life and death situation, right? I mean, it's just, you know, not necessarily your life isn't threatened, but you just feel really distressed and anguished, you know? Maybe it's like taking a final exam, you know, that's worth 90% of your grade, or, or maybe having to confront someone, or maybe you have to criticize your wife's cooking. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, or, or maybe, you know, uh, you have a major presentation in front of the higher-ups, or something like that. You're just really stressed, really distressed, a lot of anguish, as you go through this. Um, and then, whatever it was, you made it through, right? You survived. And there's this great feeling of relief because you had made it through. And when you do that, when that happens, as a follower of Jesus Christ, how have you responded when you have this great sense of relief? Is it just to enjoy that sense of feeling and maybe that sense of accomplishment and then move on? Or is there something that God wants you to know about him and that he revealed in that situation that is meant to bring you closer to the Lord? 
Because it's really easy to miss out on what God might be trying to tell you through these wonderful experiences and feelings of relief. So let's take a closer look at how we can get the most out of these awesome experiences of relief. And someone in the Bible uh, went through a very literal life and death situation. Uh, but God brought him through. And how did he respond? And let's take a look at how he responded to see how we might respond in the same situations or similar situations. So we're uh, in the book of Psalms, so turn to Psalm 116. We have Bibles if you don't have one. If you'd like to borrow a Bible, just raise your hand, and the usher will give you a Bible that you can borrow for today. Just return it to the shelf uh, after the service. Uh, I don't know what page it's on in the, the church Bible, so <laughs> you have to figure it out. Psalms is in the middle of your Bible, and so just Psalm 510. Look, turn, turn to page 510, and you'll find it there in the church Bible. We're continuing our series called An Emotional Roller Coaster. And it's basically dealing with the various emotions and feelings that we face in life and how to process them in a biblical way, in a godly way. Um, the goal is not to immediately feel better or to be happy, uh, but to know, and think, to know how to think through these emotions, how to process them, and most importantly, you know, how do you fit God in all these things? Um, now, the Sunday school answer, uh, when you ask how you should deal with emotions, especially the negative emotions like sadness, and, and distress, or discouragement, or depression, or grief, we say, well, go to God. Go to God. And the idea is that, well, you go to God, he'll make you feel better. That's the hope, or that's the idea. And that's really not the case, okay? Uh, but the real issue is, how should we go to God? What are the things that we should think through as we go and process these emotions and these feelings? Uh, he might not be uh, solving the problem or the issue right away, and he won't always take away the pain. But you see, the goal is really not to feel better. The goal is to have a bigger picture of who God is and a closer relationship with him as you process these feelings and emotions. Now, the Psalms, it gives us great examples of people uh, who have gone through very strong emotions and are a great model for us uh, in terms of how to process those emo various emotions that we might feel. Now, we normally feel that we should process uh, the emotions, especially when they're negative ones. You know, like I said, sadness, discouragement, uh, depression, disappointment, grief, things like that. But we also need to process the positive ones as well. Emotions and feelings like happiness, vindication, peace, relief. Because they are also meant to draw us closer to God. So don't forget to process the positive ones just as much as the negative ones. So when you're feeling terrible, make sure that you go to God and process those emotions. When you're feeling great, make sure that you go to God and process that emotion. Uh, I remember hearing a preacher once say that the greatest test of spiritual maturity is not how your relationship with God is when things are going badly. But the real good test of spiritual maturity is how your relationship with God is when things are going well. Because he said that, um, when things are going badly, it's really easy. Okay, I need God, man. God, help me get through this. I'm really struggling here. I'm really suffering. Help me get through this. And you really, it's easier to look to God. But when things are going well, it's really easy to forget God because you don't have this sense that you need him. And so you easily drift away from God because things are going so well. Please don't make that mistake. So when you have that sense of relief, which is a very positive emotion, what are some ways in which you can process that so that it draws you closer to the Lord? Well, Psalm 116 gives us some ideas. Let me read the first four verses, or first two verses. The psalmist writes, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. Okay, so when you are processing relief, okay, the first thing, I mean, the, the psalmist had gone through a difficult situation. The first thing that we should remember to do from here is to rejoice in our God who listens and responds. Rejoice in our God who listens and responds. Verse 1 says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. So it starts off like many psalms with this declaration about God, an expression of praise, an expression of thanks. Here we see an expression of love, of love. Why does a psalmist love the Lord? Well, because, he says here, because he listens and because he responds, he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy because he inclined his ear to me. Uh, you know, 
incline your ear to me. I mean, that, that's, that, that's the idea that he's leaning forward, that God is leaning forward and saying, what are you saying? I want to hear you. He inclines his ear towards you. Um, that's what's so awesome about the God that we worship and serve. Uh, he who oversees the entire universe and keeps every star in its place is able and willing to listen to you and to me. And more than that, he really wants to listen to you and to me. He is inclining his ear towards us. What are you saying? He wants to hear you. And we have to take it by faith because we don't really see God and we don't get an immediate response, feedback when we talk to him. But God has promised throughout his word that he hears us, that he listens to us. But more, not only that, not only does God listen, but God also responds. Verse 3, the snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. I, Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Okay, so the psalmist was in a very desperate situation. Apparently, he was near death. We don't know exactly what it was. It uh, could have been he was a, di- a sickness that he was dealing with. Uh, maybe his life was being threatened by his enemies. Uh, and I don't think you have to necessarily be near death to be able to relate to the psalmist, okay? We see the expression, the emotions that he was suffering here. It says in verse 3, I suffered distress and anguish. And I think we've all suffered from distress and anguish before, right? A couple of weeks ago, uh, I was working on my sermon late on a Saturday night. I had finished it, okay? It was around midnight or 12.30 or so. And so I just wanted to make some finishing touches on my iPad. Now, usually the files are synced or synchronized by this program called iCloud, for those of you who don't use uh, Apple computers. But iCloud, it, it kind of automatically saves it and syncs all your devices. So if it's on my computer, it's already on my iPad, okay? So um, for some reason, iCloud wasn't syncing my files. So what was on my computer wasn't on my iPad. So, hmm, what's going on here? So I'm trying to troubleshoot this and figure this, figure this out. And one of the suggestions says, well, log out of iCloud and then log back in, okay? So I logged out of iCloud, then I logged back in, and all I had was the file of that sermon that I had written that I had worked on a, a day earlier. Okay? So, so all I had now was the sermon from yesterday. I mean, the, 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 the file from yesterday. So all the work that I had done on Saturday, four hours worth of work, was gone. It was gone. And I, what, what I, so, so I'm thinking about, what, what happened here? What happened? I thought the program automatically saved. But since, I hadn't been, since it hadn't been syncing, when I logged out, it only saved the, the last file that was saved, which was the night before. Because I, I had not been saving because I thought it automatically saved. So again, I lost four hours worth of work. It was around 12.30 a.m. now, okay? Uh, I have to preach this sermon in about 10 hours at 10.30, and I pretty much lost everything. I was so mad. Okay, you don't believe how mad I was. I was so angry. Uh, how could I be so dumb not to save the file before I logged out of iCloud? I'm so, oh, man, I, I was so mad at my computer. I was so mad at Apple Computer. I was so mad at Tim Cook, who's the CEO of Apple Computer. I was so mad at Steve Jobs. He's the founder of Apple. And I'm so mad at myself. I'm just, oh, so much anguish, okay? And, man, I'm going to have to recreate four hours worth of work. Uh, and I, you know, I have to remember all this stuff. And I had carefully worded some of these things. I'm not going to get any sleep, man. I'm going to have to have these bags under my eyes as I preach. I'm going to fall asleep while I'm preaching like some of you might do. Oh, man, this is going to be terrible. I'm so anguished, distressed. Well, what did the psalmist do in that situation when he was feeling anguish and distress? Well, it says, Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver, deliver my soul. Then in verse 8, For you have delivered my soul from death. All right, so, so he called on the name of the Lord and asked for deliverance. This was a desperate cry for help. So after I lost my sermon, okay, sorry, it still <laughs> affects me. Okay, I heard Christine moving in the room next door, in the bedroom. So I went her, went there, and she goes, what happened? I told her the news. I lost everything. So I was just ranting and raving to her. And then I left to go back to work on this thing because I had only a few hours left. And so anyway, uh, Christine got out of bed. She came into the office. And she said, let me pray. Now, my, I have to admit, my initial thought was, what good is that going to do? Okay. <laughs> but I'm a pastor. Okay. I preach on prayer. I believe in prayer. So I said through gritted teeth, 
Okay, let's pray. <laughs> and so uh, Christine called upon the name of the Lord on my behalf. And I took a deep breath, said thanks, and then I went back to work, okay? And I was hoping maybe, maybe God would give me extra measure of, 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 of sufficiency and thought and creativity to recreate everything in two hours instead of four, okay? That what I thought would be a great miracle if he could do that, okay? Anyway, what was the Lord's response to the psalmist? Again, verse 8. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of of the living. So the psalmist was delivered, okay? Whatever was going on, the stress and the anguish he was feeling, he experienced salvation after he called upon the name of the Lord. And we don't know how, but somehow God pulled him through his dire situation, and that's why he's rejoicing, okay? And now he says he will continue to walk with the Lord as a living person. I will, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Man, what a relief. God delivered. So after Christine prayed, okay, uh, I continued, I started to trudge through, trying to recreate the last four hours of work that I had put in, and I continued to think, how could Apple Computer be so dumb, <laughs> okay, to allow something like this to happen? I mean, it's such an easy, why could they, how could they allow this thing to happen? Then it hit me, okay? Uh, I can only say that God put this thought in my mind, okay? I'm thinking, this can't be. This is Apple computer, not PC. This is not Microsoft. This is Apple. Oh, sorry, I mean, this is, um, just, just tell, I'm, I'm just bearing my soul here. Okay, so, um, so I did a search. I did a search for the title of my file on my computer. And lo and behold, there were two versions of that file. And one of them was dated 20 minutes before when I had logged out of iCloud. You see, Apple isn't that dumb. Okay, before I logged out of iCloud, it made a backup of everything on the iCloud drive just in case someone dumb didn't forget to, to, forgot to save, like me, okay? So it was there, all of it. And man, I love my computer. I love Tim Cook. I love Apple. I love Steve Jobs. What a relief. What a relief. What a relief, okay? So, because of the psalmist's experience with the Lord, it says, he will call upon the Lord as long as he lives. Verse 2. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. You know, if you go to a place and you get bad service, you're not going to go there anymore, right? But you go to a place and you get great service, and you have great food, and you have a great time, or, or, or they do a great job, you're going to keep going back, right? Uh, there's this uh, car wash up on uh, near uh, 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 Maple and uh, 53 called 53 touch-free car wash, okay? I go there, uh, I used to go there a lot because, you know, it doesn't have the brushes that scratch your car. So anyway, one day I went up there to get the car wash. <laughs> I drive up to the gate, and there's the owner there, I think is the owner, and I, real I forgot my wallet, okay? I, I somehow I took it out or something, and I left it at home, and I think my girls are going through it. I don't know. But anyway, no money, sorry. But anyway, um, I said, oh, man, I forgot my wallet. I, I have to back out. I can't do this today. And he goes, well, do you come here regularly? I go, well, maybe about once a month, you know. He goes, here. He pulls out a receipt, or he twitches the receipt, and writes, I owe you. You know, come back, come back next time and just pay, pay for it then. Wow. Then he let me through, and I got a free car wash. I thought, I'm never going back there again. No, no, no. I thought, wow, man, this, this guy, man, that's, that's, that's really nice. I'm always going to go there for a car wash from now on, unless I do it myself. I'm never going to go anywhere else except to this touch-free car wash. Because such great service, such a generous guy was willing to take that risk to allow me to do that. So I'm always going to go back there because I had such a great experience. Well, that's what David is going to do, or the psalmist here is going to do. Man, because he had such a great experience with what God has done for him, he is going to go to, that, to God whenever, all the time. Okay? Because um, God actually listens and God actually responds. And he rejoices in that. So how about you? Do, do you really believe that God listens to you and wants to respond to you? Throughout Scripture, we see God listening and responding to prayers. Throughout Scripture. So let's take a full advantage of this great privilege and give the Lord something to listen to and to respond to. 
So pray regularly. Pray, pray hourly if you can. In desperate dependence on him. Asking for God to work in whatever you are doing. Uh, pray corporately. All right? Uh, come to our monthly prayer gathering. First Wednesday of every month. Room 222. To pray together. And to corporately ask God to work in our midst. Because God is listening. So let's give him something to respond to. Now, there's no guarantee that he will respond in the way you want him to. But he is a God who listens and always responds in love. Let's make sure we rejoice in that, especially after a feeling, when you have that feeling of relief. Rejoice in the Lord. Second, reflect on God's character. Reflect on God's character. Verse 5. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Reflect on God's character. Okay, it says here that God is gracious, righteous, and merciful. Gracious is the idea that God is on your side. He is for you. Even though we don't deserve it, God is for you. Okay? It's righteous means that he always does the right thing. And merciful, and the word in the original language more has the idea of tenderness and compassion. In other words, God feels for you. It comes from his heart, the way he treats us. See, God is not this cold, distant, aloof type of God. He's not a cosmic cop who's just waiting for you to cross the line so he can zap you. No, he's a God who loves you, who cares for you, who wants to bless you in awesome ways. He is a God who wants to be in relationship with you. And despite our sin, despite how offensive we have been to God, he loves us and wants to build that close relationship with us. And although we deserve death, although we deserve eternal punishment from God for our sinfulness, God in his mercy and in his compassion and love sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to come down here, live the perfect life that we couldn't live. And then he died willingly gave himself to die on that cross to pay that penalty for your sin and for mine. The promise is that when we accept Christ, we receive, repent, turn from our sin, and receive Christ as our Savior who paid the penalty for our sins, we are not only forgiven, but we receive re uh, eternal life and an eternal relationship with God. And how do we know this is true? The resurrection. Three days later, after he had died, Jesus rose from the grave, physically proving that he had defeated sin and defeated death. So we have tangible proof of Jesus Christ's resurrection that shows that this is true. This, folks, is the ultimate relief. Okay, no matter what you experience on earth, being saved from hell, which we all deserve, is the ultimate relief. That's the ultimate salvation. That we who deserve nothing but God's wrath for our sin has been saved from that wrath and that we can have eternal life in a relationship with him. Do you appreciate that relationship that you have with God? That he loves you and cares for you and listens and responds. That he is gracious, that he is righteous, that he is compassionate. So reflect on that. And draw closer to him and let the relief that you feel from the various ways that he has delivered you point to the greatest deliverer and the greatest deliverance of all time through Jesus Christ. Okay? Reflect on his character. Third, reaffirm your trust in the Lord. Verse 6. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Um, so he preserves the simple. Now, the word for simple, it really means those who are open to instruction and believe every word. Okay, That's what the word means, that you're open to instruction and you believe every word. It's, it's a childlike faith, Okay, very trusting. And the simpleness is not towards other people. The simpleness is towards God. Okay, I'm open to instruction. I believe every word of God. So those who have a trusting faith in God, they, they, they know that God will take care of things. In his way and in his time, things will turn out for the best. Okay, now for me, you know, when I have a lack of trust, I always plan with contingencies. You know, I want foolproof decisions. And so when I take a step of faith sometimes, oftentimes have a backup plan just in case God doesn't deliver. That's not really trusting in God now, is it? And that's something I'm growing in. You know, and as we read God's commands, oftentimes we think we know better, don't we? You know, I mean, we're told the value of knowing God's word here in Scripture. 
So we should really get into it and study it and know it, right? And we know we're supposed to put God first in everything. But why don't we? I mean, if we were, if we were simple, we would, and God would protect us. But we think we know better. We think we know better. We don't think that studying, obeying God's word really works deep down inside. Or we think that it's hard work and doing other things that will make life work. And so we rely on those sort of things. And by doing so, we kind of step outside God's protection. So we need to trust him. Verse 7. Return, O soul, my soul, to your rest, for the Lord is down bountifully with you. So he gives us peace. Our souls can find rest because God has been good to us. And since he has been good to us in the past, he will be good to us in the future. Just as we say, he is faithful. He doesn't change. The issue is for us, do we have that trust? Can we let go and not worry about things so much? Is your soul at rest? God is trustworthy. We need to stop doing this worrying thing. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, one of my favorite verses. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's about this peace. It's not about eliminating the situation or making the problem go away. It's about experiencing God's peace. And the psalmist knows he can find peace in the Lord. Verse 10, I believed even when I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. So the psalmist believed in the Lord even when he was afflicted. Even though he's going through this dire death, close to death, near death experience, he continued to trust or believe in the Lord. And the word for believed has this idea of trust. That in the midst of all he was going through, he was going to trust in the Lord. Verse 11 says, I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. Uh, man cannot be trusted. People cannot be trusted. Only God can. Yet it's so easy to put our faith and our trust and base our happiness on others, right? How many friends I have, or if my candidate wins the election, or if I get a boyfriend, or if I get a girlfriend, or if I get married. So often we put our trust in other people. Or it's oftentimes easy to put our trust in ourselves. I can do it. I am capable. So think about it. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? Yourself, others, or the Lord? Reaffirm your trust in the Lord. Fourth, respond with heartfelt thanksgiving. Respond with heartfelt thanksgiving. Verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? Uh, now, it's impossible to repay the Lord for all his goodness to you. But that doesn't mean we don't respond, okay? That we don't express our appreciation, our thanksgiving, and our, our gratitude. So verse 13 tells us some ways we can do that. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Okay? So one is we point to the Lord. Just say how great and awesome God is. When you lift up the cup of salvation, it says here, what's that? Well, the cup, it kind of implies your lot, your portion that God has given you. It can be negative, like a cup of suffering. Uh, Jesus talks about a cup of suffering. But here it's a positive thing, a cup of salvation. It's basically how God has delivered him. Okay? Everyone has a different cup of salvation. We all have the cup of salvation through Jesus Christ. But in situations, you know, we have ways that God has delivered us. Sometimes in big ways, sometimes in small ways. Um, sometimes you've been saved from death. Others, you know, you just overcome a trial or difficulty. But lifting it up is that sense of joy and gratitude in what God has given you. I think of those who win a trophy. You know, sometimes people win a trophy, the Stanley Cup or a golf trophy. They'll lift it up. Sometimes they'll kiss it. More as a way to glorify themselves. But when we do this, lifting up the cup of salvation, we are doing it to praise the Lord. Not to say, look what I did. But we lift it up to say, look what God did in my life. So wear it proudly. Whatever God has done for you, wear it proudly in honor and awe of God. And this is not private praise and thanksgiving. We see this repeated in the presence of all his people, in the presence of all his people in these final verses. We need to share what God has done for you publicly, publicly, not, not to boast about ourselves, but to boast about our God, right? We need more of that around. 
on here. Pe people need to see that God is at work in our lives. People need to see that God answers prayers, that God responds. Because God is at work, folks. Don't hide it. You might say, well, my faith is a private faith. Well, a private faith is not a biblical faith because the faith we see here in Scripture is very public. Yeah, it has its personal side of it, but it's also public where you share with others what you've seen God do for you. Okay? Second, uh, keep your promises. Verse 14 says, I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Okay? I fulfill my vows to the Lord. You know, lots of people in their very desperate situation, they make promises to God. Okay? I, maybe you've done this before. God, if you let me do this, if I get an A, I'll go to church every Sunday. Or, Lord, if you help me, if that girl, girl says yes to my asking her to the prom, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll read my Bible every day. Or, you know, God, if you save me through this, I'll, you know, I'll do that, right? And then once he does it, he delivers. You get the good grade. She says yes. You know, something good happens. You survive. You often forget what you said, right? That's a very thankful response, though, is it? It's like asking the plumber to do work for you after you get a quote, and then he does it and you don't pay him. Okay? That's not very thankful, right? Psalmist, in gratitude and appreciation, keeps his promises that he made to the Lord and fulfills his vows before everyone. So make sure that you do that gladly. That when God, if you, if you make a vow, make sure that you fulfill it when God fulfills his part of it, right? And don't make, be hasty in making these vows, take them seriously. Ecclesiastes uh, 5 says this, When you go to God, do not delay in paying it. No pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Okay, so be careful with your vows. You don't have to make them. Okay, but if you do, make sure that you pay it as a way to say thanks to the Lord. Fourthly, verse 15, or 16. The psalmist writes, O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. So in appreciation for what God has done for you, live a life of service. Live a life of service. I am your servant. That's the idea that God has freed him from the clutches of death, and he owes his very life to God. And in appreciation, he acknowledges this and says, I am your servant. Can you truly say that you are the Lord's servant? He has rescued you from the domain of death, the domain of darkness, and from eternity in hell, to have eternal life with him. He has saved you from that. You owe your very life to him. So are you his servant? That whatever he says goes? And that's something I think we we'll, we'll all wrestle with. But as believers in Jesus Christ, again, who have been saved from eternity in hell, it's only right and proper that we give our lives to our Lord, to obey and serve him. So have you done that? It's a wonderful expression of appreciation to the one who gave his life for you, to give your life for him. Lastly, whoops, offer sacrifices. Okay, offer sacrifices. Verse 17, I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Again, uh, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, the Old Testament talks about these. Uh, they were offerings that weren't required by the law, but were given out of free will by the worshiper to express thanks and appreciation to God. Okay? Uh, this was above and beyond their tithes and their, offer, their sin offerings and the other required sacrifices. And this is another way in which we can express appreciation to God for what he has done. And I would say a thank offering would be above and beyond your tithe or your regular giving. Uh, one great way to do this is you can give to the church's mission fund, you can give to our benevolent fund, you can give to the Barry Jinta Hawaii fund. No, no, I'm just kidding, not, not that one, okay? You can give to the Lord's work in uh, other mission organizations or other Christian organizations to, to just say thanks to God. Um, many times when I buy a new recreational item that I don't really need but I want, uh, as a thanks offering, I will take the exact same amount and offer that to a charity or Christian organization as a thank offering to say thank you to God. I, you don't have to do that, but how might you say thanks to the Lord for the ways that he has blessed you? Uh, financial offerings, again, are a great way to express our appreciation and our thanks to a generous God. But don't give these offerings reluctantly or under compulsion. These free will offerings that must come out of a cheerful heart. So when you want to 
express your appreciation of someone, you willingly and cheerfully give them a gift, right? Our Lord should be no different. No different. Now, someone once said that the greatest feeling in the world is relief. Okay? And I can understand that, you know, when you, that, that day when, when I found that file that was still there, man, I was on cloud nine. But when, when, but in order, it's weird because the greatest feeling in the world is relief, but in order to feel relief, you have to experience this awful feeling of terror or stress or anguish. Because without it, then you really don't feel relief, right? And we really hate that feeling of stress and anguish and distress and things like that. But you really don't appreciate the highs until you've experienced the lows. And we have to learn to appreciate the lows. That's why James tells us, you know, to recount it all joy when you encounter various trials. Because even though they're difficult, they're uncomfortable, they're stressful and anxious, they oftentimes bring about doubts. God uses them to strengthen us and to mature us and to help us experience more of him. So let's make sure we do that. Maybe you've experienced relief recently. Here are some good ways to respond and to process these feelings of relief so that they draw you closer to God. And if you're going through a tough time right now, uh, look to the Lord. Call upon him as the psalmist did. And look forward in faith as to how the Lord might deliver you in the future. Let's bow for a moment. What is God saying to you this morning as we took a look at the deliverance that this psalmist faced and how he processed that. Maybe God is saying that you need to really look to him in your time of trouble. Or maybe you've forgotten him after you've experienced these wonderful deliverances in your past. Maybe God is asking you to really rejoice in him because he listens and responds or that you need to reflect more on God's character. Or maybe you need to re reaffirm your trust in the Lord or to respond in heartfelt thanksgiving. What is God saying to you? Let's take a moment. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who responds, a God who listens, who inclines his ear towards us so that you might hear us and we might speak to you. Lord, help us to take full advantage of that, to rejoice in that, and to reflect on your character. We see that you are gracious, righteous, tender-hearted, compassionate. And help us, Lord, to always reaffirm our trust in you, to see that this world has nothing compared to you, nothing that is trustworthy compared to you. Lord, that we would respond with heartfelt thanksgiving. So, Lord, work on us and change us to draw us closer to you. It's a Jesus that we pray.